My name is Kay Sakai Nakal, an old, old Bainbridge Islander. I've lived here 97 years, except for the three and a half years in American concentration camp. I was 22 years old when we were uplifted. That was a very sad day. We couldn't believe that American citizens were being uprooted. Well, the day we were uprooted, it was so painful because we all know that our home is a safe haven and we feel very safe and secure. And to be uprooted like that, not knowing where we were going, it just felt like you were up in the air and you can't come down. I am Lily Kitamoto Kodama. I was seven years old and I had no idea of what was happening in the world. Um, I do remember that the, the night before uh, we had to leave the island, uh, Mama told me that tomorrow we're going to take the ferry to Seattle and it's going to be like a vacation. And um, in those days, just to go to Seattle on the ferry was really exciting. It was a, a unusual thing to happen. And so I tossed and turned all night because I was so excited to go to Seattle the next day. And so I'm Hisa Hayashida Matsudaira, and I was six years old when we were interned. When we were evacuated, my father uh, was, a, was Japanese, and so he did not have an American citizenship. And so he was taken away uh, before and went to Missoula, Montana, and was detained there. And he, wouldn't, he didn't get back to us until we were in Manzanar. And, that was a, a hard thing for me, when, when, especially when he came back, cause, because I thought he was a criminal, because that's where people who are criminals get imprisoned. And so when he came back, I remember going to the bathroom, and I hid in the toilets and for all day and I could hear people calling me and say, he saw, he saw Papa's home. But I just couldn't get myself out of there. And, and the only thing that got me out, I think was because it was time to eat. Yeah. My name is Francis Kitamoto Ikigami and I was five years old during the time of the internment. But as a child, I was a very independent person since I was the middle child. I usually did things on my own and uh, we lived on a farm. So uh, I didn't have other playmates. I only had my siblings and, off, and once in a while my cousins. And I'd be playing outdoors most of the time, either with pets and, or doing exploring on my own. So the camp experience was um, kind of overwhelming for me to see all the people and have so many children to play with. Um, that was at times frightening and sometimes fun too because we had so many people to play with and so many adults to look after you. It was not only your mother, but your mother's friends or neighbors that would come around and carry you and and uh, tell you how to behave. And so uh, in that way, it was different. Well, to get there, we were on the train for two nights and three days. And then we transferred to the bus at Mojave Desert. And then the bus kept going and going and going, and it got warmer, warmer but we still don't know where we were at or where we were going. And as I don't know how long it took, but by the time I looked out the windshield 
I could see way up ahead heat waves. You could really see the heat waves. And a black building, which I learned was a barrack, and here's a brown-skinned man standing on top of the roof. And so I nudged my seatmate and I said, am I glad I don't live in a place like that? Well, we're going and going and going, and eventually the bus turned in there. And oh, I was just heartbroken because I thought, oh, what an ungodly place. When we were taken to Manzanar and, and our, the rooms were just, um, the places we stayed was just one big room with just uh, cots on there for our beds. And the place to eat was uh, called the mess hall. And I kind of, uh, I didn't even think about it until I happened to, when I saw the film um, Les Miserables or, uh, and, and it showed the, when it came to the part where the orphans are lined up and to receive their food, and I thought, well, that's how it was in camp. And, and um, I remember being all excited because they, it was an army base, I think, and so that um, uh, the dinnerware was the uh, army, uh, well, the metal, uh, brown discs that you opened up and they had a handle and then they had a metal knife fork and spoon and a little round disc that it opened up and it became a cup and I thought that was so special and exciting and then we went down the mess hall line and they plopped food on there and I think there was Vienna sausage and I don't know if it was mashed potatoes but it wasn't rice which we were used to eating um, but then then they plopped this uh, yucky green gray stuff on the plate and I didn't know what it was, but um, we were raised to clean our plates and I took one bite and I didn't like it. And I learned it was canned spinach. And so um, I sat there refusing to eat it. Um, adults came and said, oh, just think of Papa. I remember he ate canned spinach and it made him strong, and, um, but I still refused to eat it. And I can't remember if I ever, um, uh, finished it at all, but that's what I remember about the first meal in, in camp. And then after we uh, got off the bus, the nurse was there giving us uh, some kind of shot. What was it? Typhoid shot? I don't know what it was. I forgot. And the somebody was there gave us a great big sack, canvas bag, and a smaller one, and said, go to that straw pile and fill it up. That is your mattress and pillow. So that's what we had to do. And when I think about it now, mothers with little children, what did she do filling up all those sacks? Oh, I was pretty young and I was in kindergarten and so one day I was in school and the next day I was on the train and so I missed my friends from school and uh, and I think that's what one of the things that I miss the most uh, and we I was so young that I didn't get the full impact of, of being uprooted. As I look back now, I, I think how, how brave or how, how our Issei and Nisei could adjust to something. There was a, there's a saying in Japanese, shitakaganai, and that means it can't be helped. And so that was some, Sometimes that was their philosophy is they got taken away, but it can't be helped. We have to do the best we can with, with what we are doing. It wasn't fair, that's one thing, uh, but I guess it couldn't have been helped. So you just have to suck it up and, and 
keep on going. I remember we played the usual childhood games like uh, kick the can and marbles and jump roping and we played jacks on the barrack floor. Um, but then we played hide and seek. And what I remember is um, the, I think it was our mothers gathered us together and warned us to be really careful about where we hid because there are scorpions and rattlesnakes hiding in different places. And if either one of them bit you, you could get really sick or you could even die. And I remember that vividly. Um, and the other thing I remember as a child is that the sandstorms were not like I've heard it called dust storms, but it was sand, and it, when the it sand blew, it hurt our faces. And there was an event uh, outside. They had an amphitheater where they showed movies, I think, and they had a uh, they had different events there. And the entire camp was there, sitting outside. And uh, I was in charge of my little brother, who was two and a half, almost three. And uh, uh, this big sand wind came up and the, the sand was blowing all around and everybody got up all at one time to leave to go back to the barracks and and here we more or less got trampled and Frank fell onto the ground and he got scraped and so he was bleeding in the face and I remember that really well too um, so um, I, I don't remember saying it but I heard my mother telling a, a person who was interviewing her that I eventually did say to her, what kind of vacation is this anyway? All the families were together. Men and women weren't separated. They had to build in such a hurry. They used uh, lumber that wasn't cured. So the heat would shrink them. And so we would have spaces between the floors and the walls. And we only had one outside wall, no inside wall. So the two by fours were showing. So that's where we put our toothbrush and hairbrush or comb or whatever, because we didn't have any um, table, chairs or anything. Just iron cots for bed, straw mattress, khaki blanket. Oh, in Manzanar, we had a small oil stove and Every morning, the block manager or whoever brought some oil and filled our little container on the heater. And it wasn't a big container, it was just real small because the heater was like tiny. Hardly. No fans. So, you know, just if you stand around the heater, you're comfortable, but otherwise. But I never felt that cold there for some reason. I don't know why. But I was old enough that I couldn't play with the young kids. I knew I had to find a job of some sort. And I got a job at the public health department, a typist clerk, along with several others. And that's where I worked all the time. I was in Manzanar for the 11 months. And I loved it and I made lots of friends. So it wasn't so bad, kept busy. Like my sister said, you know, our family unit was together and my mother was always there and my siblings and uh, I don't remember any traumatic experience except for the time I was, um, someone was playing baseball that I was watching through his bat and it, and I had an injury, had to be rushed to the hospital and have stitches. So I, you know, I remembered having that scar for quite a while. But other than that, I, um, it was kind of like an adventure. You peek in the canteen and you see a lot of teenagers dancing and, uh, it was just like a different experience, so. And I, I marvel today how much the mothers had to cope with. Um, for instance, my baby sister was nine months old, and so she was still in diapers, and I, Frank may well have been too, at two, um, and they had to wash their clothes on the scrub board, um, wash the diapers on the scrub board. And, and um, I've been interviewed quite a 
quite frequently and one reporter after I was through said you know you don't sound bitter have you ever wondered about that and that was the first time anyone asked me that and the first time I realized that I didn't feel this bitterness and I thought I wonder why that is and and so my friend pointed out to me that our mothers did protect us and and um, I cannot remember even today the mothers they did have tea together uh, they were boiling water on the pot belly stove and I don't ever remember them complaining about their situation in camp when they had all that sand and dust and uh, terrible food and uh, and uh, that's the marvel to me and I don't know if it's a cultural thing or a generational thing but um, and so and that and I think they wanted to make it as nice as okay for uh, the children I've gone back to both Manzanar and Minidoka where our families were placed during the war and um, when I went back and when I read that there were 10 camps all together and I just marvel that the government was able to do that um, as I said Manzanar was the first one and they kept constructing these others um, and how did they manage that and I've heard people who don't believe this happened and I could understand why they don't believe it because it's a marvel to me and um, and and um, I don't feel bitter, but I do think it, it was a terrible wrong and that was unconstitutional. And I, I um, Bainbridge Island was different in that we were a multi-ethnic community and people knew each other and they were slow to believe that the propaganda that we could be spies um, and they welcomed us home. And so I didn't have any... Uh, uh, experience of discrimination here on the island but we got my husband and I got married in 1955 and on our we looked for an apartment and it was in, we lived in Seattle and the first apartment uh, we answered the vacancy at and this was on the central area on first hill and um, the manager took one look at us and said sorry we don't rent to Japs and the bang went the door and then on our honeymoon trip we're driving to Los Angeles and we check in to a, a motel that had a vacancy sign and they would say, no, sorry, no vacancy. And so we'd have to wait till we found one that would allow us to um, stay. And then we'd stop in a small town and we'd go into a, a cafeteria, cafe to have lunch and nobody would wait on us. And those were the first real experiences of discrimination. Well, and even when we bought our try to buy our first home, which was even 12 years after the war ended. Um, this was on the east side of Seattle, and uh, we paid our money, and it was ready to close, and the real estate agent called us and said the next-door neighbors of the house we were buying were good friends of the sellers, and they did not want Japanese living next door, so the seller backed out. And so those are things that I experienced well after, oh, I'd say, 10, 12 years when the war ended. My parents did not lose their property. Uh, as I said, the Filipino man who continued to work for my parents after my grandparents, he and his cousins moved into our farmhouse and maintained the house and the farm. Uh, they didn't continue to farm because the island had a shipyard and that had better pay for them. But we didn't begrudge them that, but we did not lose our property. And um, the thing is, uh, and that too is an unusual thing because I think many of the Filipinos did do that for the farmers whom they had worked for. Uh, that doesn't mean that not that everyone came out of it unscathed, but we were fine. And my father, as I said, was not a farmer. Um, he worked for Freelander and Sons Jewelries, uh, the Jewish family business that was in existence until, oh, I'd say. Uh, just a short time ago, but I think it's at least 10 or 15 years, maybe even longer. But anyway, he worked for Mr. Freelander. And one, I should say that my father was not with us because the FBI came right after Pearl Harbor and went to every Japanese home on the island. And they took away many of the men because they were not citizens and many were farmers. And um, they found leftover dynamite in the barns that was used to clear the land from the old growth tree stumps and um, many farmers owned rifles and, uh, and if they weren't citizens they were 
uh, arrested, but you know, Japanese could not become citizens until 1951. It was a law of the land, and even if they wanted to, they couldn't. And, and so when we arrived home, I wasn't too sure what the climate was with the community, so I was always kind of looking over my shoulder, make sure nobody was following me or anything, but never happened. I didn't have to worry. So right away, I tried to join whatever I could and be very active in the community. Yeah, Bainbridge Island is really a special place, really. It's everyone so kind and caring and supportive and real understanding. So we're very fortunate, really we are. I wonder what the people on the island felt about us and about our leaving. I know when we got back, we were very welcomed and we had a, a much easier time than my husband who lived in Seattle. And when he came back to his home, all they had was a light bulb in their whole house. Every, all the appliances and everything was taken out. And so we were lucky to have our uh, Filipino friends and workers come into our house and live there while we were gone. So many of the Caucasian uh, people too also took care of, of some of the things. I know down the hill we um, entrusted our rifles and guns and things like that to them. And so they, they took care of a lot of our property too. I volunteer at the Bainbridge Island Historical Museum and I'm amazed at all the people who come and uh, from all over the world and so many people have ne never heard of the internment, are not educated that that really happened and it's exciting to see schools uh, take up the curriculum and uh, I think that's what the need is. More people need to be educated as to what happened uh, to help those that are probably uh, in danger again of having this happen to them. And uh, I think that's the purpose in our mission is to um, let the world know that this had actually happened and that it would never happen again to anybody. Don't let it happen again. I think it's, uh, as an American citizen, you need to watch out and help the people around you. You can't just stay in one little, one little group or one little community. You have to look out for everyone around. And so you have to speak up for others who cannot speak up for themselves or who don't understand what's happening to them. Um, and I think that's what democracy is about. You get a choice, but you need to, you need to be careful of what your choices are. Well, we got to make sure it never happens to anybody ever again. And I think a lot of it was fear, prejudice, And so, I think we should try to help each other, love one another, and try to be happy living together with all ethnic groups.